Hello, Sergey. How are you? Hey guys, good morning. <laughs> Thanks for joining. That's no problem. Hey, Brian. <clears throat> so we'll do the normal thing wait about five minutes here see who all joins Hello. Hello. Morning. Sergey, are you going to be out at KubeCon? A couple of weeks. I'm sorry? Are you going to be attending KubeCon in a couple of weeks? No, unfortunately, no. Too many things to do. Yeah. I know the feeling. Yeah. So. Endless loop. <laughs> Yeah, no, VJ is speaking a couple times. I'll be out to talk about the project. Yeah, no, if you have any slides, Sergey, you can go ahead and share your screen. I don't have anything okay. uh, to start with, start really. So mm -hmm. In about a couple more minutes, we'll wait then. Let me see how I share. Okay. Cool. Can you guys see screen? Yep. <laughs> awesome. So do you do you guys want to start or are you still waiting? Um, we'll give one more minute. Okay. Uh, till five after, and then we can get going. Okay, yeah, so it's five after. Um, so we can go ahead and get started just real quick. Uh, welcome to the Query Language Standard Working Group um, under the Observability tag. Um, today, we have the pleasure of having Sergey uh, present the KQLM language. 
I don't have any other updates um, other than for anybody who's on the call, please sign in and I'll post that in the comments. Um, otherwise, please take it away, Sergey. Okay, awesome. So, uh, unfortunately, there will be no live demo. So, all the language and all the system is mostly internal, and I didn't have permission to show the live um, UI live working uh, language because of the uh, confidential reasons. So, I didn't have the permission. So, but still, I have a permission to kind of talk about the language and the syntax, semantics, capabilities, things like that. So, we're probably focusing mostly on that. So uh, the language uh, name is KQLM, cool Super Language for Metrics. And um, it's a language for internal Microsoft MCDS DBMS, which is part of uh, overall um, telemetry offering. And this is probably the biggest provider uh, and the service uh, to store and serve metrics data inside the Microsoft, all major products use. Uh, our offering. Um, so as I said, Kustik Query Language stands for, uh, KQLM stands for Kustik Query Language for Metrics. Uh, syntax was inherited, and I'll actually get to it why I've inherited the syntax from um, pretty popular, surprisingly very popular um, uh, other DBMS inside of uh, Microsoft. Um, and we inherited it for like a re uh, reduced uh, um learning curve for uh, new new customers so language was added uh on top of existing dbms so all this metrics db series dbms existed it was already um, serving lots of customers and generally initially it only had like um structured queries api I think about it like a um, function call um through the sdk or um, external api and it actually worked pretty well for majority of scenarios, but analytics, right? Because for analytics, people want to have users, want to have more control. They want to set a sequence of operations, control the sequence, um, control the parameters of these operations. And um, at that point, structured queries were not really efficient and we needed the language. Um, so currently uh, language is used uh, for dashboarding, data scraping, alerting, analytics, and streaming. So, uh, slide. When we were thinking about the adding the language, uh, we first of all, like there were several challenges. One of them was, okay, which kind of syntax we use for a language. Uh, we were looking at the prom, but then we actually had a feedback from customers that it's a new learning curve for them. Language is pretty different from anything else that they use. And they were like, why, do you, why don't you guys just use something which we already know? Why don't you just piggyback on existing experience? And um, we were immediately like pointed to the language, this uh, Kusta query language, which we also know internally is pretty much well, uh, very well, well, well used. Um, I was initially, when I was got familiar with this language, I was like, why didn't you guys just use SQL? SQL is so very well known. And then starting using Kusta, I kind of realized why it's very easy to start using the language. This uh, going forward, let's just jumping a little bit ahead. It's a piped. Uh, so statement is um, there are, uh, query text is like a set of statements, statements divided by pipe, nothing new. Uh, but it kind of very easily set the picture of the sequence of operation which user intends to do. So it's pretty popular and we were like, okay, let's actually look into it and try to utilize the same syntax. And um, yeah, that's why we kind of inherited the syntax. It played good and bad for us. So it relaxed um, a learning curve for people. People were like, oh, so I know the syntax. I know how to start, I know how to filter, I know to, how to do the projections, aggregations, things like that, but still, the data model was slightly different. So Custo runs on top of like a tabular, tabular relational data model. We are time series. Time series are somewhat different and um, operations were and semantics were somewhat different, which confused people. So inheriting syntax was kind of good and bad. Yes, it's reduced the learning curve. Onboarding was easier, but then it ended up with confusion. Oh, wow, I'm doing group by where is this kind of parameter? Where is that kind of parameter? Do these projections, why do I cannot project dimensions? And you're like, many things which we had to explain. So we actually regret uh, calling it KQLM. 
because currently it's not really helping, but more harming us. So inheriting syntax was, again, like good and bad. The other design time consideration, which we were uh, looking at is like, okay, do we give this language for time series data only, or we expand it for more observability scenarios? Like uh, it's, it's pretty obvious that user while working with metrics might want to have a transition to logs or to traces, right? Um, have a language for all of that. But at that point of time, we realized that uh, all of that, all of these logs and traces, these are separate system. Uh, it will be pretty complex from functional perspective to define a single language. But the biggest concern was more about the scale. So the system is working at pretty high scale um, and language must support a high scale. When I say the high scale, again, I cannot tell like the global number, but I was given permission to tell like the orders. So we talk about uh, billions of measurements a minute which backend received and it's just for a single customer in a single region and millions tens of millions of queries again just for a single customer in a single region in a minute so it's pretty high scale so whatever we build it should fulfill this scale i mean parsing should be fast binding ex further execution should be fast so at that point of time we kind of realize that if we expand this to more domains we might lose it and yes, we will give a language which is capable, but it just won't work at scale. It won't be cost efficient and things like that. So we decided, okay, let's keep it. Let's keep it to um, the MCT data model only. And that's what it is right now. And yeah, it kind of work at scale. Um, pretty much we fulfilled all, all the goals. Um, yeah, so just again, like why we didn't go the way like single language to rule them all, mostly because of the scale uh, considerations. Uh, okay, so these were design time considerations. Yeah, guys, if you have any questions, please feel free to interrupt me. I'm happy to, to, happy to answer. Uh, okay, data model, as I said, right? So uh, language operates on top of time series data. <clears throat> and uh, where we consider time series as a sequence of data points uh, listed in a time order and having same observation context. Uh, so data point encapsulates a measurement value, right, in corresponding time. Nothing new. Measurement can be of different type, can be double, can be histogram, something else. Um, observation context in our case is represent this combination of metric name and dimensional data. So as you probably see here, right, like example of a time series in our world. Um, observation context, metric name, private bytes, and then dimensional data, application front end, host VM1. So this is like observation context and the sequence of measurements. In this case, just double values. Uh, so that's a data data model. Uh, oh, I did not finish that statement. Sorry about that. Uh, uh, so each request in our case is the combination of a query text and a time frame. So we intentionally did not encapsulate time frame in the statement um, because it allow us optimizations like compile query once and then use it again again, like cache of a query plan, right? If you encapsulate it, uh, time frame in a text, then it's a problem. You always need to parse the query. So we made the time frame as a runtime argument to a query text. Um, as the second point says, the language syntax is like pipe based, as I mentioned, right? Just a sequence of statements divided by pipe. Um, I guess there was previous, I, I didn't have a chance to attend, but there was a, a, a session like a couple months ago. Uh, with another language which also approach uh, have have the same approach like this pipe based um, uh, syntax. Um, each operation has own syntax semantics expectations, but we try to mostly rely on type enforcement. So there are functions, there are operations, and um, like if function allows this input type, doesn't matter what it is, it should be um, should be working. Um, and the semantics like list of operations, uh, time series operations, pretty limited. Uh, it's a retrieval, filtering, <clears throat> data altering, projections, computations, aggregations, correlations. <clears throat> and I just uh, quickly go over them uh, one by one. Okay. So, oh no. Okay. I did not. 
Okay, move. Okay, let me switch to this mode. Animations will kick, will kick in. So as I mentioned, right, so <clears throat> query text is, uh, so request is the combination of the time frame and a query text. And if this is a, just a blind data retrieval, right, so this is a syntax which we kind of enforce. So it's a um, metric name, and then we enforce uh, customers to specify uh, kind of shape of the vector per time seria. So in order to avoid the situation when we have like, uh, uh, let's say one time seria where uh, <coughs> publications are every second and then the other time series uh, where uh, publications every minute, we try to align data points. And that's why we can then force customer to tell us, okay, how do you want to fetch the data um, and align the data point? So we can enforce a step so that vectors become of the same size. So customer can tell, I want to select some average, last, max, histogram, but they kind of must tell, okay, what's the step? So we end up then with the same vector for each time series. And that's again, like um, uh, what result might look like, right? So yeah, bytes received, select some by 10 minutes in one hour. So I'll have six data point in each vector. So that's how result will look like. Again, this is, don't, don't consider please this as a tabular response. It's, more like a single entry, um, but these are the attributes, right? The dimensional data, name of the vector, and the data points for this vector. Um, so it's possible to retrieve multiple vector for single time series at once, right? So as a customer can tell from bytes received, select max, give it an alias as max bytes, min as min bytes, in 10 minutes, right, by 10 minutes. And then we end up with two vectors for each um, uh, observation context. And this is handy for further on computation. I'll have an example, but then I can do a projection of range, which is like max minus min. Um, so this is a data retrieval filtering. So filtering, it's a where operator, the MCDS where operator, where as a customer, I can use a dimensional data or a uh, actual data points uh, to perform different types of filtering. So for example, like it's pretty simple, right? Data center equal is and host start with VM1, nothing special. Uh, can be something like, okay, environment equal prod, traffic type in, and you specify a list of uh, values which denote this particular dimension. Uh, more complex, uh, like, uh, if user one, they can have sequence of where, which is effectively the same as just concatenating with end. Uh, but for usability, user might consider to say, okay, each each uh, predicate in its own where. So in this case, right, there is a, let's say user decided to uh, separate dimensional filtering and um, data filtering. So dimensional, um, just environment equal prod, but then like more complex uh, string function, which concatenates region uh, dot data center and check that result in is in this list. Uh, and then the second uh, is like take all the data points for some which are requested, compute scalar average, and only return it times series where the scalar average is greater than 124. So these semantics are also allowed. Pretty flexible. So allowed, gives quite a lot of flexibility for customers to work with data. Um, series projection computation. So another operation is project, right? Just as I mentioned, they can receive request max, a min and max, uh, have like two um, uh, data point sequences associated with a single uh, observation context and then compute range, just project the range, which is max minus min. Um, oh, I did not add, I did not add. Okay, so there are more things which are available here. Basically, project is about how do I modify a data in the vector, not changing vector attribute itself, not reducing the size of the vector, right? No, it's not aggregation. For example, like a good example would be, I can do something like a delta of max bytes, right? And this will basically just go over max byte and compute the delta of a previous data point and current data point. So a rate is also available, interpolations available. So how do I mo modify <clears throat> uh, existing vector, just applying a function on top of it? 
Uh, the difference uh, is uh, aggregations. Aggregations, we basically just change a data set itself and we uh, support aggregations temporal and spatial. So this example is spatial aggregation, right? I requested the bytes received for all that I'm seated, but then I group them by dimension and calculating the sum. Uh, I also can do group by dimensions and by time. So in this example, I try to find the most, the biggest bytes I saw uh, in entire data center um, in scope of one minute. Just like for for last hour, I want to see how what was the max value for bytes received in a single minute. So uh, this is this is also possible. <clears throat> and the last one is the correlations uh, and joins. Uh, correlation basically joins where we allow to correlate metric to a cell or metric to other metrics, uh, and usually it's for analytics or SLO SLI. Uh, um, uh, scenarios, right? So as a user, I want to calculate availability. In most cases, customer have either one metric or two metrics, like for the for success request and fail request. I just join them together and then calculate availability. It's failure requests divided by total requests multiplied by 100. So that this is kind of possible. The other um, example is like from a same metric, right? So I have single metric request, which has a dimension for status, right? So I uh, on the left side of the join, I calculate total requests by data center and host. Then on the right uh, on the right side, I filter them by failure and again bring them to data center and host, and then calculate availability as failure by total. So also possible can join metric to itself. Um, yeah, so this is like what's the capabilities of um, joins. So joins also support semantics of. Uh, inner, left outer, right outer, full outer, semi joins. This is also possible. Uh, but it's on dimension, full dimension match. So we don't support a subset of dimensions because it can lead to situations like many to many, which we don't support. We just block that. I think in Prometheus, this can cause a crash. And we just decided to semantically block it so that customer don't end up with the runtime. Let's say it's not cool when monitor crashes because of you started to emit a new data. So we semantically block it at the compilation time. Do you uh, have the capability on the join, sorry to interrupt, to um, match on differently named fields if they're yes. the same? So basically, the, uh, this will be something like that. So if uh, there are different dimension names, right? so, uh, actually, let's go to previous one. Let's say success has the DC, but the failures have data center. So you must kind of bring them to the same shape, saying something like where, uh, where DC, DC as data center, center. Oh, sorry, with DC, with DC as data center. And then as long as uh, this metric has data center, then they will match. So this is how we kind of um, avoid it. If you have, uh, if like, uh, query if both data sources have unmatching dimensions, we'll fail the compilation saying that we cannot um, even compile the query because uh, both schemas don't have matching dimensions. Um, yeah, so this is it. Complex data points. As I mentioned, like histograms are also supported. So I can, for example, request latency metric, uh, select a histogram. And then if this metric collect a histogram, let again, like by 10 minutes, we'll aggregate all histograms in that metric to a single histogram in scope of 10 minutes. Then I can do some filtering, aggregate the histogram to a bigger histogram by dimensional like spatial aggregation, and then extract a couple of percentiles out of it. Um, if the metric doesn't have the histogram, it's more like a double values, and all of those double values will be grouped into a single histogram by this 10 minutes, right? And then again, like the same process. So this is these are the semantics for kind of working with the histograms. Other complex sampling types are supported, but I mean they're more like internal. Uh, yeah, user messaging. And the other thing which we found pretty helpful for us is the user feedback, right? So again, nothing new. Um, that's how inherited from conventional compilers. Uh, if user like writes a query and they try to run it, we do our best attempt to help them a lot with wrong syntax, wrong semantics, uh, runtime errors, and we use like a same 
messaging feedback um, where each message has its code uh, and it's not like an error code it's a message code um, and message code has a link and then it's a like a TSG for a customer to go and figure out what did they do wrong on themselves. So each uh, page has explanation what happened wrong, uh, how can they fix it, what they need to read next to fix the thing. So it helps us a lot to reduce the customer support with questions about the syntax, semantics, something they do wrong. Uh, we actually don't hear from customers a lot. Uh, they usually manage to solve the problems on their own. Uh, so in this case, right, so user had a typo instead of host salt, right? And we have a first message. And then they try to divide the sum by the data center. You cannot do this like this. Again, like type enforcement kicks, kicks in. You cannot do the division between these two types. Um, this is basically it. Uh, again, it's um, uh, pretty short, right? Again, no live demo. So this is the language which you have. And it's for a time series uh, DBMS. Uh, time series uh, DBMS only. It's not like for everything. Cool, thank you. Um, I have one question before anybody else. Uh, <laughs> I want to be greedy. On the uh, step size that uh, users have to say when mm -hmm. they say select some by 10 minutes, um, do you have any uh, code in there that will adjust the step size based on the time frame? Like if they ask for a month or two months of data, does that automatically change or will they actually get what they're asking for? Uh, so if they receive... A one month of request, ask for one month of data, and then the they have like let's say one well, one second step. Yeah, uh -huh. or ten minute step, whatever. Yeah, I mean, it's again like it's nothing to do with syntax and semantics. Semantics allow it. What kicks in is more of a system level restriction of the query cost. So we have a query cost restriction. So it doesn't matter. I mean, like you might request a one hour of data but uh, which will work with the billions of measurements and that's already expensive, right? So we have limits and uh, this is where the enforcement happened. Not like for a time frame, but more for a cost. It's like cost driven. Mm -hmm. So we then... will they receive a message like this just yes, saying yes, it will be up. it will be it will be a message like their query is throttled because it's so expensive and there will be a pointer to a documentation which will explain that okay, like add more filter, reduce the time frame, right? So how you can reduce the size, optimize your query. Uh, mm -hmm. if you want to reduce the costs. Other questions? Anybody have? Yeah, again, I don't think it's anything new. It's just mm -hmm. a slightly different syntax for a time series data. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How did you balance the need or the request of some people to do advanced analytics or more complex things like rolling windows or uh, period over period? Is any of that supported or do you shunt users off to a separate system to perform that analysis? I mean, we do have, so currently, this is one of the asks from users, right? And uh, we want to add it. Uh, so if, um, in Chrome, for example, the offset, right? So want to compare current data with the data one uh, one day ago. So it's in the backlog, it just again doesn't get uh, lots of traction because not many users want it. Same with the moving window. Yes, there are ads, but they're not that, um, they're not blocking, it's more like people want to have better analytics. Currently, yes, unfortunately they have to use it through the other system, but I mean, it can be added against syntax and uh, semantics and the model uh, doesn't, uh, really block it. It's more of effort and the priorities. Gotcha. Thanks. Definitely, this language is not really planned even forward to encapsulate anything with tracing, with logs. Because semantics are pretty much bounded to time series data. And again, like the biggest, biggest concern is the scale. Uh, how will it all operate in at scale, at the scale of millions, tens of millions of queries in a minute? We need to operate lots of data and again, like provide the latency, which is like on the milliseconds level. That's a challenge. Uh, and that's why this group is actually interesting because it's a very ambitious goal. Just want to underline that for. Microsoft, the scale is one of the criteria which is important. Mm -hmm. 
yeah, for us too. And some of the vendors, the scale is really important as well. Um, but then on the user side, I think it's a lot of interop. Uh, folks want to have that capability to really tie all the data together. So we have to balance that and figure out what the right path to go is. Right. Um, cool. And were there, oh, let's see. Slim had a question. But perhaps I missed it, but I assume selecting a time range happens in the where clause. Yeah, could you talk about that point again, please, Sergey? Oh, sorry, I didn't uh, notice the, the messages in chat. Nah, it's all good. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> so uh, time frame, as I mentioned, it comes from outside. Uh, it's think about is the additional parameter which goes with the text. So we intentionally did not specify. Um, we did. We don't allow specifying time range in uh, query tags because it allows optimizations like compile a query once and then use it again, again, and again. If the text is, is uh, time frame is encapsulated in the text, right? You always need to parse it. Parsing is expensive. At high scale, it's expensive. It's work with string. It's string like it's memory allocations. It's like lots of things. Is that answer? Okay, cool. So, <laughs> any other thoughts, questions? Okay. Sergey, so, yeah, the, uh, the question on scale when you're trying to join all the different data types, um, do you think that's more a function of the actual syntax or semantics or just trying to join different data stores um, and trying to keep that efficient? Uh... So for us, it's again, it's like different systems, right? And if these are different system having a single engine, which would efficient, efficiently prefetch the data, right? Like it's, a, it's already more of a data model question. At scale, like it should be polished to perfection on the many levels, right? Like from compilation to execution to how the data is stored and partitioned. So this is the challenge, right? If these different types of data, their partition different, they are stored differently, and they are actually in a different domains. It's barely possible, not maybe possible again for us, it was um, uh, challenging to bring them together at the at scale and guarantee some latency and availability. That's the problem. So uh, for me, it's again like um, very hard to detach language from a data model to allow efficiency. So maybe then it's a requirement also to figure out a data model, which will kind of sort them all, tracing logs and, and will be efficient. So for example, tables didn't work for us. Tables are uniform, they are very flexible, but because this uniformity, this flexibility, get the extra price. And this price is like, uh, then affects the performance, uh, affects cogs and the other aspects. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. And is the backing data store for the language then uh, kind of a monolith where all of the data is present, or do you have it sharded and partitioned in a way that makes the queries a little more efficient based on the select clause or the from clause? I mean, uh, this part, I probably won't be able to elaborate a lot because mm -hmm. I'm not sure what I can tell or I cannot tell, but um, there are lots of optimizations on the processing on the how the data is stored, how it's uh, uh, partitioned, uh, distributed, right? How, what's the shape the data takes? Lots of optimization to allow the scale. And again, it's all it starts with the data model because we know the data model, we know the restrictions of the data model, we can pretty much efficiently tell, okay, this will be the syntax, that's how compilation will work, that's the execution, right? What kind of optimization we do can go to on the execution, how we can store the data efficiently to allow a quick fetch and um, other things, right? So data model kind of allows that. If you don't know the data model, data model is too flexible, well, all the downstream uh, aspects will be more expensive as well. That's our learning again, I don't exist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. What do you think the the most popular 
feature is that you'd carry forward and if you had to redesign a new language? And what's the feature you drop? Uh, correlations and um, that's a good question. I'm not ready to answer. It's just like shooting mm -hmm. top of my head. The most used and what people love is the correlations. I mean, bringing in data from different metrics and correlating it. Uh, what else? What would I drop? Good question. No, sorry, not ready to answer. Just want to, to let's tell some nonsense. Need to think about it. Yeah, <laughs> no worries. <laughs> yeah, but it does seem the piping approach is pretty popular with a lot yeah. of languages here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's um, <laughs> and the, if the, like from syntax perspective, yes, I'd probably like keep it because. Uh, People even with like a no knowledge of the language, they find it very simple. Like you don't need to jump through the statement to figure out where is the beginning, where is the end, which parts of the statement belong to what. You just have a sequence, each operation does its own job and it's pretty much reflect how the data will flow through. So I'd probably, yeah, would probably keep it if it's mm -hmm. syntax, yep. Um, are there any aspects of the language where, let's say, one series is missing some data, um, you know, has some nulls or nands or whatnot, um, and you're trying to join it, correlate it? Um, are there any aspects where the user can control the behavior? So let me go back to this slide. There is the aspect with the joining or... Mm, so let's say, I mean, we joined these two metrics and one of them have nulls. So there is an aspect which is painful, but we did not find any good ways to have help user easily with that. So when it comes to this computation rise of failures per 15 minutes and success per 15 minutes, it will be data point by data point. Um, addition right so if let's say let me go back so i explain it better what was the mean and max so for example max bytes and min bytes if i do the difference it will be like 791 minus 206 656 minus one it's like correlating data points are just subtracted and you receive the result if any of them has null so null any operation with null result in null and this is something which is painful for customers in availability computations because you don't always have failures, right? And the good system is good, like failures are occasional. And in some cases they have, let's say, what was that availability signal? So in some cases they might not have failure, failure will be null. And if single data point in this expression is null, all result will be null. And that's kind of they'll um, say, oh, why my availability is null? And we have to tell them your one of your data points is null. You must replace nulls explicitly with something which makes sense to you, like replace it with zero or interpolate it, right? So think about what you, how you uh, deal with nulls. Uh, do the data point by data point expression. We allow also like uh, decision-making on a data point uh, level. Um, so this is kind of painful, but we didn't find any good way to help customers there. Because again, like just blindly replacing all nulls with zeros, you then never know, did I have an outage or did I report a zero? Like, null kind of help with that, like just no data. For what reason? Well, it's something to go and figure out. And have you had any pushback from uh, customers on that kind of aspect where you're requiring them to really understand their query and fix it in a way that they will know what it's doing or hopefully they'll know what it's doing versus trying to make it easy and make some automatic choices for them like substitution and then hopefully... Yeah, so <clears throat> initially when we introduced when we introduced it, there was a pretty big pushback but after explaining, they really understood, oh, okay, it actually helps me. 
if I start masking it, I'll be in more problems. Then I don't know like what was happening. Was it a real zero like where uh, I was just emitting or did I like miss something? So in vast majority, of, it's like all majority of, in, in all the cases, when we explain the reasoning, why they were pretty much buying it and saying, okay, yes, we understand now why we need to change the query. It's just not, it's kind of counterintuitive to distinguish this important between the null and zero. So we kind of go forward with this. Right now it's like we cannot get rid of it. Null is the kind of first class citizen in um, our data model. And yes, it's confusing, but one pe once people learn what's the difference there, kind of, oh, okay, it makes sense. And do you think having that kind of explicit call out in the query itself helps other users to understand what the query is doing when they're trying to diagnose issues? This is something that we did in past. So we were trying to help customers and analyzing the, the runtime expressions, which end up with nulls. We had some semantics in the runtime to see, oh, one data point having a null and contributes to the entire result being null. But as you can imagine, it has big impact, right? Because you do it on the every data point and at scale this helpful semantics, they are impactful. We introduced this and then basically what we did, we were issuing a warning message here that, hey, one of your expression issued null. So you probably want to learn more. We give it a pointer to THJ with all the explanation to help customer about that, but it's too expensive. It's effectively like run semantics at the low level to figure out if expression ends up with null in the, if for each data point. So eventually we removed that because again, like it's expensive, but initially we had it to kind of again, help them to get this paradigm. Right now, we don't really have these questions. Uh, people are mostly like familiar with that, uh, with this aspect of behavior, but initially it was, yeah, something not clear. Gotcha, that's great. Any other questions from folks on the call? I guess one other question I have, um, was there ever any consideration given to introducing presentation aspects to the language? Um, Cause it's some, like most metric systems, the majority of consumption is via graphs. Um, so was there any thought given to that? You mean uh, the result already produces some visual? Or... Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh... and being able to control things saying like, I want, uh, my color pattern to be X based on the data center, you know, that kind of stuff. Now, this was never a requirement. We generally consider the backend and point for language as just something that provides the data and then it's up to consumer how to, what to do with this data. Do they want to have it in some other systems? Do they want to present it? Like, do they want to keep it? It's up to their consideration. Sure, makes sense. And to be honest, we never heard such a requirement from users. So they're mostly happy with the existing ecosystem. Mm -hmm. yeah. That sounds good. Great. Well, we're almost at time. Um, if anybody else on the call um, has questions, please let us know. Uh, what would be a good way for folks to reach out if they have other questions after the call? Uh, I think we have a chat. I periodically visit it or just, I don't know, find me on LinkedIn. <laughs> Great. All righty. Well, thank you very much, Sergey, for presenting and also for your, uh, filling out the interview doc that we merged into the repo, uh, the tag repo. So that's up for anybody to view. And we'll try to get the recording of this call up within a few weeks, probably after KubeCon coming up. But again, thank you everybody for attending and have a great day. Thank you guys. Bye. Right. Thank you.